I'm sure that, like me, you get a lot of unsolicited emails. And no doubt also, like me, you use an email client that filters a great deal of them into a spam folder. But unfortunately, there are still a lot of gullible people in this world, and the field is ripe for those spammers who can use a little bit of ingenuity. I'm talking now not just about spam, which is annoying enough, but scams, which aim to part you from your money and even your identity. During a 10-week period from the 8th of February to the 18th of April this year, I received 124 emails that I believed constituted real scams, quite aside from countless other unwanted messages offering sex or dating, many of which I suspect were a front for additional scams, products for sale, CBD, sex items, etc., gambling, and investment, especially Bitcoin. Many of the messages offered temptingly large sums of money, and 23 of them specifically invoked religion or charity as the intended purpose of such donations. Four simply said, for charity, while another specified charity work. Two said, to carry on the charity work in your country. A couple were more detailed, specifying that it was for poor people, abused children, less privileged, churches, orphanages, and suffering widows in the society. One was very detailed, claiming to be to help fight against coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic in the world, and help the poor people off the streets, also to contribute to poverty reduction, public donations, public charity, orphanages, less privileged, and help poor individuals in your community. The pandemic also featured in another that just said to support the COVID-19 pandemic. Widows and orphans featured in several of the messages, simply specifying orphanage homes in one case, or going into more detail in another, to fund the poor, orphanages, widows and charity organisations. A third not only mentioned the orphanages, but also invoked God's work for establishing an orphanage's home for the poor and needy, and also propagating the word of God, and to endeavour that the house of God is maintained. Two others also mentioned God's work, saying, for God's work and for the work of God. The less privileged were the subject of three, with the first saying just that, while the other two said, to assist the less privileged and charity organisations of your choice, and to provide assistance to the less privileged people around you. One simply stated, for humanitarian purposes, and another, to help the poor. A couple of messages appeared to attempt to make their offerings more believable by specifying that only 40% of the sum offered was for personal use, with the remaining 60% for humanitarian work, widows and orphans, and to take care of the less privileged people. Other messages appealed less directly to greed and appeared in the guise of business proposals. One of these simply referred to a business opportunity, while another claimed to be looking for a business relationship to facilitate investment in my country. A third intriguingly referenced a new project with a limited number of seats. 
There was also an interesting offer supposedly coming from an investment bank and one message claiming rather cryptically that a mutual corporation was being offered. Several claimed to be looking for investment managers. These ranged from the blunt call from an agent for a fund manager and administrator to handle substantial funds to a more specific requirement for someone with experience in a particular business, real estate, agribusiness, agriculture, engineering, manufacturing, or any good business to handle politically sensitive Ghanaian funds for a percentage. A couple of identical messages gave the following very detailed specification. An investment opportunity in real estate, oil and gas, agriculture, health, aviation, tourism, retail, construction, IT and communications, technology, education, energy, engineering, utilities, telecoms, mining, maritime, sustainable energy, and a host of other profitable ventures. It required prospects to have a business plan with the capability to manage huge funds and the ability to deliver good and sustainable returns on investment. One message offered loans to businesses in need of additional capital to maintain financial stability in order to help strengthen, revitalize and stimulate their business with individual projects starting from 3 million well into the 100 to 200 million dollar range and covering land development, expansion capital, working capital, real estate property, construction projects, factoring, energy, manufacturing, telecommunications, and real estate acquisitions such as hotel and commercial properties. Two virtually identical messages which claimed to be from respectively an Alex Ramaphosa based in Johannesburg and a John Monk acting as a liaison officer for the Sao Tome government but located in the UK openly explained that they wished to bypass ethics rules by appointing as a middleman a puppet who would carry out the instructions of an insider consultant regarding the supply of large quantities of crude oil to refineries. Another was also something to do with the crude oil business, but this time apparently offering more of a partnership although scant details were offered at this stage. Claiming to be from Busy Bee Fabrics Vietnam, one message sought someone to work on a commission basis, collecting overdue invoices from Canada, possibly working from home. Interestingly, it claimed that the reason many invoices remained unpaid was that most customers preferred to make payment by check. But these were not cashable outside Canada. Although Busy Bee Fabrics Limited Ho Chi Minh Vietnam does appear to be a legitimate manufacturer of various clothing materials, assorted fabrics and costumes, the home working opportunity they are offering and which also appears on various sites around the internet is certainly not one that I would recommend from previous experiences. Many of the offers tried to improve their credibility by claiming to originate from large and well-known organizations 
For example, international ones such as the International Monetary Fund, Interpol, UNICEF and the United Nations or lotteries such as Camelot National Lottery Group and Euro Millions. Charities also featured heavily. The Christian Aid Mission, the Church Army, the Francis and Patrick Connolly family, Oxfam, the Stephen Quant Charity, the Thomas Morris family, and the United World Charity Organizations and the apparent security of several U.S. government organizations was also employed. The FBI, Homeland Security, the 2nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, Helmand Province, Afghanistan, the United States Postal Service, and the U.S. Treasury. Unsurprisingly, the names of banks were also used in a number of cases. The Central Bank of Nigeria, the City Bank of Texas, the Corris Bank International Group, the First International Bank of Israel Limited, FIBI, Ghana Commercial Bank, the United Bank of Africa, Weatherby's Private Bank, UK, and the World Bank Group Africa. Other companies supposedly involved were Amazon, Blazer Capital Inc., Busy Bee Fabrics Limited, FedEx, Google, Hero Honda Company, Mark John and Co., Midway International Airport, Chicago, Western Union, and Ypro Limited. Personal names used included some that were borrowed from real people, while others may have been real ones inadvertently revealed via the email addresses used by the scammers, but the majority were probably completely fictitious. In some cases, there was a reference to previous contact as a way of making the scam seem less suspicious. Such claims included a request to confirm that funds had been received, a request to validate a supposed international money transfer, a request to confirm that another individual was a legitimate recipient of funds, Bitcoin profit statements for fictitious accounts supposedly owned. These continue to flood into my scam folder right up to the present time. A request to confirm a supposed product order. Reference to a supposed entry to a competition. The suggestion that a subscription had expired a request to confirm a subscription cancellation, the offer of removal from a database, a request to confirm a removal instruction from an adult list, a request to acknowledge ownership of a suspected login, acknowledgement of a supposed previous message to them, a request to confirm that the email address was still active. The majority of the emails simply awaited replies, although one or two did request phone contact, and some gave links to click. However, nearly a quarter of them specifically requested personal information and, in several cases, submission of a fee, ranging from $96 to $195, to secure the release of funds. Almost all of those asking for information were seeking name, address, and telephone numbers, and the majority also asked for occupation. Around half requested age, 
while a couple inquired as to marital status and several as to nationality or gender. But alarmingly, one requested bank details and several sought copies of ID, such as driving license, passport, etc. So where do all these annoying and potentially dangerous scam emails, which used to be nicknamed Nigerian scams, come from? Judging purely from those email addresses that sported top-level domains identifying specific countries, the majority appeared to originate mostly in South and Central America rather than on the African subcontinent. And a very common source was tramitemunicipal.cl, which is Chile, uh, with the email headed no subject. However, as three of the total of 124 messages received, during that period did claim to be from African individuals. One a Sudanese, another a Ghanaian, with a third claiming to be from Benin. Meanwhile, a fourth message gave a Zanzibar email address to be used for responses. And curiously, the single message identifiable as having originated from Bahrain actually gave Nigerian contact details, while two messages did specifically mention that they originated in Nigeria. But email addresses quoted within the messages indicated that India might also be heavily implicated. Five of the messages specifically gave Indian email addresses. Two gave a South African address, one a Bulgarian, another an Estonian, and one Russian. But continuing with the more direct evidence referred to earlier, China and Hong Kong could be identified in 4% of cases, with the USA and Hungary responsible for a similar amount. Taiwan accounted for 6%, as did the EU countries Belgium, Germany and Italy, while 10% came from Japan. Russia, Romania and the Ukraine each seemed to have originated just 2% with similar amounts coming from Bahrain, Cuba, Iran, Turkey and Vietnam. One message claimed that its sender was living in Spain. Many of the messages gave links to click, but those that did quote email addresses to be used for responses utilised a wide variety of domains. As already indicated, these included country domains, government domains, a wide variety of email hosts, as well as various .com addresses and miscellaneous others. Now, on to what all these scam messages were supposedly offering. As already described, there were lots of business proposals, a variety of prizes, free samples and other gifts were on offer too, ranging from aerial samples, little gift cards and Morrison vouchers, as well as food stamps and free groceries, to the chance to win a Samsung smartphone or a PlayStation 5, as well as requests to take part in surveys in return for Amazon rewards. But far more intriguing were the just over 50% of the messages that offered specific sums of money. The smallest was $3,500. 
and the largest was $196 million. In total, the sums offered came to almost $1 billion, just over three quarters of a billion euros, or more than £663.5 million. Pounds. Adding in the vague, unspecified amounts, the total would definitely have exceeded $1 billion. Of course, a number of the communications were internet-related. Security alerts and warnings of expiring software, unsubscribe confirmation requests, and online order confirmation requests. And in these pandemic times, it was hardly surprising that a number of scammers made reference to COVID in their presentations. Others gave links to supposedly evidential videos and newspaper articles that are freely available online, no doubt hoping that these would add credibility to the stories used. Some of the stories were extremely imaginative, if frequently rather unbelievable and many of them included remarkably similar details. A couple of the scams capitalized on the lottery wins of Francis and Patrick Connolly from Northern Ireland and Thomas and Kathleen Morris from Minnesota. In the latter case, even giving a link to the YouTube video announcement of their win in an attempt to make the story more plausible. A Thomas Zadari claimed to be 17 years old and the only child of Chief James Zadari, whom he described as a rich and famous man. Oddly, he identified his father's death as having occurred sometime in 2019. He was supposedly unable to withdraw the money until his 21st birthday, so needed someone to act on his behalf. In a similar story, also claiming to be from a 17-year-old boy, one Rafael Camara, son of the late Chief Vincent Camara, who died from a coronavirus infection during a business trip to France in October 2020. This individual said that he was in hiding, with his stepmother trying to take his life as the sole recipient of his father's wealth. A Mrs. Maureen Greaves, who claimed to have only weeks to live due to cardiac and kidney failure, said she was the widow of the late Dr. Alan Greaves, organist at St. Saviour's Church in Sheffield for 40 years, who was attacked and beaten on his way to play at Midnight Mass, Christmas 2013. She gave a couple of newspaper links to back up her story. Once again, a supposed born-again Christian wanted to entrust their savings to someone who would use them wisely. A Mrs. Janeth Johnson said she was undergoing cancer treatment in Cyprus and had just three months to live. She claimed to be the widow of a Dr. Davis Wakis Johnson, who she said had died in 2012, following a four-day illness, having worked in the American Embassy in Spain for 14 years. Having been married for 11 years, they were childless. As a born-again Christian, she wanted his substantial savings to be wisely used by a believer for godly purposes. 
An almost identical story was presented by someone claiming to be Mrs. Linda Morrison, an arthritis sufferer confined to a wheelchair following stroke and with terminal cancer that meant she had just 12 months to live. Her late husband, Robert Morrison, apparently also worked in an embassy, this time the UK embassy in Australia, where he worked for 20 years. He also died from a four-day illness, but in his case it was in 2010. They also ended up childless, following 15 years of marriage and once more as born-again Christians wish to see their life savings used by a fellow believer for God's work. Mrs. Jessica Singh said she'd been married to a Peter Singh who worked at the Indian Embassy in Madrid for nine years before dying from a Covid infection last year. They were married for 11 years, she said, and were childless. While alive, he deposited substantial funds in a bank in India. Once again, the correspondent said she was dying of cancer, with just three months to live this time. And as in previous examples, she had also suffered a stroke. Again, this was someone who needed help using their funds for God's work. A Mrs. Aisling Hamza Faris, another childless widow dying from cancer, this one claiming to be 59 years old and with six months to live, also sought a very honest and God-fearing person to use her late husband's hard-earned money for charitable work. Another supposedly elderly widow, Mrs. Christabel Horst, again a cancer sufferer, similarly wished her late husband Wilhelm Frank Horst's life savings to be used for God's work while a 58-year-old Canadian, Mrs. Linda S. Arthur, whose late husband was, she claimed, Japanese, said she was suffering a long-term illness and she wanted her savings to be used for the Lord's work. Also claiming to be a cancer sufferer dying in hospital, a Mrs. Teresa Sampson, again childless, whose husband, a gold mining CEO, she said, died in a plane crash, was keen for his accumulated wealth to be used philanthropically. A 69-year-old Mrs. Patricia Leonard, apparently also dying of cancer, simply claimed that she wished to donate her savings to help the less privileged. While a Mrs. Janet Blanchard, claiming to be a 72-year-old dying childless widow, said she wanted to set up a charity foundation to distribute money to help poor people, abused children, the less privileged, churches, orphanages, and suffering widows. Mrs. Cindy Esther Chow, childless widow of the late Richard Chow, who died 11 years ago, said she had been asked by their fund managers to arrange release of their funds but she was in hospital undergoing treatment for esophageal cancer with only months to live and she wanted to ensure that greedy relatives didn't get hold of the money so needed assistance to access the funds. Conveniently, she was unable to communicate by phone because of her illness so had to use email. Claiming to be a bank official a Francis Danyi said that his good friend Gabriel Settin, unmarried and without any next of kin, 
died in a seven-vehicle accident on the 11th of May 2007, when a total of 34 other people were also killed. With Mr. Setin's large fixed deposit now maturing, Mr. Danny wished to rescue it before the bank discovered that the owner was deceased as he claimed his directors would then appropriate the funds for themselves. A similar story from someone claiming to be a barrister by the name of Mark John concerned the recovery of the deposited funds of another deceased individual, Paul Lewis Haley, who had reportedly died in an air crash along with his wife and who had similarly left no next of kin to inherit his fortune. Once again, the funds risked being confiscated unless the conspirators claimed them by pretending to be related to the unfortunate individual. A Mrs. Rose Al Fayed Cox, who claimed to be the manager of the foreign remittance department of a bank, with her husband Alavas Michael Cox being the assistant vault manager in the same bank, said that there was money in their safety deposit vault that had belonged to former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, who was killed by the Americans in 2006. Again, they proposed releasing the money to someone posing as the next of kin to the deceased. Even more extreme was someone actually claiming to be the daughter of Colonel Gaddafi. Aisha al-Gaddafi, as she called herself, said that along with her son she was in hiding owing to the international community's opinion of the Gaddafi family, and that she needed help recovering the funds that her father had deposited in Turkey, disguised as household effects. As if it would make her story more plausible, she included a link to a BBC News item entitled the Gaddafi clan, where are they now? One cryptic message claimed that an individual with a similar name to myself had died in a ghastly rail accident, and it offered to reveal more details on contact. An intriguing message from someone claiming to be a 16-year-old girl one Mariana Naiboke Bikono, whose parents were dead, said that she had a very confidential issue to discuss. Several of the messages advised complete secrecy, obviously concerned that any third party would probably take a more objective view and caution against being scammed. But considering the outlandish nature of some of the claims, one wonders how anyone would be stupid enough to believe them. A postmaster has found your abandoned package containing an ATM card loaded with the sum of one and a half million dollars and is asking why are you keeping silent and refusing to take your package, and do we have the authority to confiscate your funds? Your cry for help during the pandemic has been heard, and Oxfam are donating funds to you. The FBI has investigated a lottery win in your name and has declared it legitimate. For a fee, they will release your winnings. FedEx are also holding a lottery check in your name and need a fee to release it. The US Treasury has a briefcase full of money that they want to pass on to you, and a diplomat has just arrived at an airport with a box of cash that he wants to pass on to you. 
A box of cash was also discovered in a warehouse that should have been handed over to you on a previous occasion. The United Nations and Interpol want to compensate you for having been scammed or for having your money withheld by corrupt officials. An African bank is also making a similar offer. A solicitor is offering to declare you as next of kin for one of his deceased clients. The financial partner of a prominent politician who has now died wants to split the proceeds with you. A bank offered a telegraphic transfer of funds owed, which it emphasised was the method recommended by the EU and the World Bank due to fraudulent activities going on around the world. An elderly man who has been repeatedly scammed, he says, advises that you really have to stop dealing with those people that are contacting you and telling you that your fund is with them. It's not in any way with them. They are only taking advantage of you and they will dry you up until you have nothing. He then proceeds to offer a safe way of receiving a substantial sum which he claims has worked for him. A political opposition party has pallets of money waiting to be invested. One offer of funds warned against the possibility of impersonators trying to muscle in on the deal and asked to be informed of any such communications. A US serviceman serving in Afghanistan once helped smuggling out his share of a small fortune in US dollars that he and his fellow soldiers discovered hidden in barrels in Helmand province. The Central Bank of Nigeria is airlifting your funds to you, disguised as sensitive photographic material in view of the level of corruption in that country and you are advised to maintain that fiction. You are asked whether you authorised a Mr. Garcia Robert from Ohio to withdraw funds on your behalf and to report back if you did not. An Indian philanthropist is giving away 25% of his wealth to charity and a further 25% to individuals. You've been selected as a recipient. People say that a fool and his money are soon parted, but as scammers become ever more inventive, even the educated and cautious among us can easily let our guards slip. Whether it's the size of the fortune being offered, aimed at cashing in on our human greed and weakness, or the appeal to the selfless side of our character and the desire to do some good in the world, we must all be ever more alert to ensure that these unscrupulous individuals don't become wealthy at our expense. I hope that this video will serve as a timely reminder of the online presence of so many scammers and the care we must take if we are to avoid becoming yet another victim.